All right, hello and welcome to Engineering Ethics at NGIT. This is the uh, Hangout video for lesson four. Um, so the Hangout was moved an hour later. It's now at one o'clock um, on Wednesdays and you can get it to it from the link on Moodle. Uh, I would appreciate if people show up and have some conversation. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a bad time or if just people just don't wanna talk, but uh, you can consider it open office hours. So I'll be here for at least an hour and you can show up and stay or leave as you need. Um, you don't have to commit to the whole hour. You can just show up and ask questions and then take off when you need to. Uh, yeah, so um, let me go ahead and jump into the lesson. Oh, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention was, um, uh, I'm officially moving my office hours. Uh, they were at on Tuesday from 10 to 11, uh, right before my honors class and I decided to move them until right after my honors class at one o'clock. So from one o'clock to two o'clock, I'll be in my office. Uh, my office is in Colomore 420. Um, I've been in my office hours on Tuesday, but I've been getting to the office like 10 minutes late. Um, I'm not sure if that missed anyone. I apologize if I did, uh, but just to make sure that I'm not missing the first 10 minutes of office hours, uh, I moved it to after class. So I know I'll be on campus then. So. Uh, if you want to stop by Colmer 420 and chat about uh, the class, chat about your assignments or gradings or anything like that, um, that would be the time to do it. Um, okay, let me jump into the class now. Okay, so we're on lesson four. Um, remember in lesson three, we talked about uh, consequentialism. We talked about the Ford Pinto case. We did uh, the trolley problem, um, these kinds of things. If you have questions about any of this, you uh, should have, I guess, completed your replies last night. So hopefully everyone's done with lesson three. But we're gonna be sticking with the Pinto case. Um, uh, we're not going to introduce a new ethical theory yet. Uh, we're going to still be working with inconsequentialism. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Dennis Droya. So let me go into the Prezi. So Dennis Droya was the field recall coordinator at Ford uh, during the Pinto uh, disaster, 72 to 75. Uh, he was a guy who could have recalled the Pinto and he didn't. And he explains why he didn't in uh, the essay. And you can read the essay in, uh, uh, on Moodle. Um, I just wanted to go just sort of briefly through the topics and see if anyone had any questions. Uh, if Andre is here to ask questions, no pressure. Um, so, uh, so Joya explains why he, um, why they didn't do a recall, and he explains it in terms of what he calls scripts or script schemas. Um, a script. Here we go, script schema. So a, a script, there's your secret word. Uh, a script is a, a pattern of behavior, and it's usually uh, involving multiple people uh, of, of what's expected and appropriate at what times. The example that we're all familiar with is the script for ordering food at a fast food restaurant, or the script for ordering food at a sit down restaurant also. Right? There's, there's an order of operations, there's an order in which the thing goes, though you know, the waiter comes up to you, or you walk up to the cashier, and then they, they can take your order. There's a, there's a back and forth exchange that's expected in that kind of interaction. And we all know what that, how that exchange works and that's what allows us to interact uh, uh, with a total stranger, right? So, so usually sharing food or, uh, or giving people money uh, usually requires some uh, measure of trust, but in a cashier or a, a waiter environment, you don't know the person you're interacting with usually. Um, they're usually complete strangers, but you can trust them anyway, not only because you trust the establishment, but because you have this uh, pattern of interaction uh, that, um, that you can both follow, and you both know how to follow it, and so that can lead you through the interaction and uh, uh, satisfy everyone's interests. Uh, so so the, scheme, the script schema is the social uh, method for I interacting. Uh, we're all familiar with it. We have to use this in a variety of situations. Um, but sometimes we stick to the script too carefully. So this is how uh, Joya describes his interaction. He says, uh, I could have issued a recall at Ford, 
Um, he even describes feeling uncomfortable seeing the uh, reports of the burned out Pintos coming back. Um, but uh, Ford had a policy for when they issued recalls um, for uh, uh, their policy was it had, had to be high enough frequency of occurrence and there had to be a clear uh, uh, defect that could be fixed. And he said the, for the Pintos, we were getting back these horrific photos, but um, it wasn't very many cases and uh, it, it didn't, there was no uh, defective part that they knew about. Uh, so because it didn't meet the criteria, it didn't uh, get recalled. And Joy, and Joy says, and it was my job to follow the criteria. Um, uh, go back. Uh, so Joy says it was his job to follow the criteria. Uh, that's what they paid him for. It was his position as field recall coordinator to, to execute that um, policy. If he didn't do it, then he would be fired and someone else would do it. So, uh, so he says it's because of the corporate script that he did what he did. And that's really the subject of this lesson. So you can read um, Joya's article, uh, Pinto Fires and Personal Ethics, uh, to sort of get his perspective. Uh, you can ask yourself if he made the right decision or the wrong decision. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll mention that Joya now uh, works at the business school at uh, uh, Penn State, um, which is a very high-ranked business school. And he teaches business ethics at the business school. Uh, he even talks about that a little bit in his paper. So uh, joy is one thing. I also have a few sections from the book on worker responsibilities and rights. Um, that's uh, these slides over here. Um, oh yeah, we're gonna talk about corporate loyalty, uh, managing conflicts. Um, yeah, so this is just introduced the topic, I guess. Um, the, the topic is about following scripts, following uh, these social expectations. Um, we've talked already a little bit, especially when we were talking about consequentialism and the trolley problem, uh, about how people sometimes act selfishly or uh, act greedily. Um, uh, David Foster Wallace talks about in the natural default setting, this is when people act selfishly. And this is an explanation for people's behavior, and it's very typical to say that when people do things that are wrong, that they're acting in their own self-interest, that they're acting selfishly. Um, but the conformity cases, right, these cases of following orders, suggest that it's not just that people act selfishly, but that they also act as a result of social pressure, that they're obedient, that they're conformists, that they will uh, adopt whatever the expectations are of them, and importantly, that they'll do that even when it seems to go against their own interests, right? So Dennis Droya talks about being kept up at night, um, worrying about whether he made the right decision. Uh, he talks about the emotional reactions that he felt looking at the pictures of the burned out pintos, right? So um, he doesn't feel good about what he's doing. Um, in fact, it, it, uh, it provokes strong reactions in him, but he's able to, he says in the paper, he's able to quiet his emotions uh, because there's these expectations of his job. Um, so this is a case where people are in some, in some sense working against their own interests. I, I mean, Dennis Ray gets paid a lot of money for his job, so it, it is in his interest in, in that sense. But he doesn't feel comfortable with it uh, in the moment. And he's willing to go through with something that he's not comfortable with, not just because he's getting paid and compensated, but also because he's being told and there's a script to follow. And because he can follow the script, he doesn't have to think too hard about whether he should be doing it or whether it's the right thing to do. So if people are being conformists, um, not, not merely selfish, but if they're also obedient, um, then uh, this is something we also need to keep in mind, uh, uh, understanding our own behavior, understanding other people's behavior, wh why people act the way they do. Um, also know about yourself that you're more likely to, uh, that it's harder to resist pressure from a superior, or if, you know, if your boss is telling you to do something, then um, you're going to feel a lot more pressure to do it just because they're your boss, even if it's the wrong thing to do. And even if your own moral uh, uh, evaluation says that it's the wrong thing to do, you might go through with it anyway because uh, your boss told you, your boss told you to, or your superior officer told you to, or whatever. Um, so I, I guess that's the main introduction to the uh, class, uh, to the lesson. Um, 
the other things in the optional readings are more detailed about the psychology of obedience and conformity. There's the ASH experiment. It's a conformity experiment. Uh, the difference between conformity and obedience. Conformity is when you conform to social peers. So when you're in a group of people who are of your same social status. And obedience is when you conform to people who are of a different social status. So your boss um, or your uh, superior officer or your teacher, right? If your teacher tells you to do something, uh, um, it's not just another person telling you to do something. It's also someone who has control of your grades, who has um, influence on your uh, standing in the school and so on. And that means that you might feel additional pressure to do, right? And this is why there's uh, ethical uh, restrictions on what teachers or superior officers or bosses can do uh, because of this imbalance of power. Um, so it's important to understand how that imbalance of the power affects our psychology, affects what we're willing and able to do. Right, so it's not just about what you think is right and wrong, because you might even do things you know are wrong if, if you're in situations where someone tells you to. And it's important to understand. Uh, maybe I'll just stop there and, and see if Andrea has anything she wants to talk about in particular. No? Oh, one second. Okay. I'll wait. Yeah, so Andrea says in chat, she says, um, that it's important to point out uh, how office culture or work culture, how that either cultivates or doesn't cultivate good ethics. Um, this, is a, this is a very, very important point um, that uh, it's, it's uh, because we're so susceptible to the social environment, um, it, it matters a lot how that environment is structured and what the expectations are in that environment because that sets what people are going to do. Um, and if you have a corporate culture that um, uh, doesn't care about ethics, then the, then the employees won't care about ethics. Even if they're good people, even if they themselves individually have strong uh, ethic, ethical values, maybe being put in an environment where there's not a culture that cares about certain ethical issues uh, can, can uh, damage that. So uh, a good example of this is the Lee Iacocca safety doesn't sell, right? When the CEO at the top is saying safety doesn't sell and all of the employees know that the boss doesn't care about safety, then that's going to make all the employees very reluctant to talk about safety or bring up safety issues. Um, if they, you know, if, if it means risking their job, if it means that they might get fired, uh, then it creates this culture where safety is just pushed out of the discussion. It's just not part of the consideration. Uh, it doesn't fall in the ethical scope, right? And that's not just a failure of individual people. That's a, a cultural failure. It's that the, um, yeah, it's that the system doesn't encourage thinking about ethics. So the book talks about this quite a bit. Um, I don't. I, I guess I go into this a little bit in the lecture. Um, I don't think I talk about it much in the in my classes, though. But um, it, it, it matters to build an ethical corporate environment or an ethical business, an ethical team, any kind of team project. Um, it matter. It matters that the people who are in the team um, and the people who are in, uh, leading the team um, that they keep. Uh, ethical issues at the forefront of their mind and that they make it explicit that they're going to address those issues within the within the organization if you don't have clear signals from the top that these issues matter and that they uh, can be addressed um, that, that there are procedures for addressing them uh, if you don't get clear signals from the top that this is the case then people just just won't they won't act ethically they won't uh, feel any pressure to act ethically and then you have and you build an unethical corporate environment um, so that means that the, uh, the, the managers, the leaders, the bosses need to send the signal that the ethics matter, and then they need to act on that signal. It's, it's not enough to just uh, say the words or send out an email, but the managers need to show the employees that they themselves are being held to ethical standards also. Um, and if there's duplicity, if there's, uh, if there's any sense from the, 
from the employees if the managers are saying one thing but doing another, right? This kind of duplicity, this kind of uh, dishonesty, it's a lack of integrity, and it's also the kind of thing that builds a corporate culture that doesn't um, respect the ethical issues. Yeah, uh, Andrew says leadership sets the standard, uh, the culture or climate, whether they're harm or aid in conflict resolution. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so this is um, important. No matter uh, both professional and public life, um, you're going to get into conflicts that need to be managed in various ways. And there are strategies for doing this in productive ways. Uh, there, there are also ways of doing this less productively that uh, exacerbate the conflict. Um, so. Uh, Finding ways of dealing with conflict. Uh, this is part of what it means to be a professional. It's part of what it means to be a, a person in public life. Uh, the public, I mean, sorry, the, the book gives some uh, discussion of uh, how to manage conflicts um, appropriately, uh, focusing on people. Uh, uh, focusing on people is, is bad. Focusing on people uh, 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 makes gets people's emotions involved, gets people's egos involved, and that's when. Uh, um, uh, communication starts to break down, interaction starts to break down. What you want to do is separate the people from the problem. When there's a conflict, it's not just the, it's usually not just the people involved, it's usually also there's some problem that needs to be made, worked, worked through. And being able to through, not get people's emotions involved or not get, not make it personal. Sometimes, sometimes there are personal issues and sometimes it is people that are the problem and that makes managing the conflict even more difficult. Um, uh, but uh, even in those cases, focus on what the problems that the people bring to the table and why uh, they're, they're making an issue. Um, focus on uh, interests. What, what, what do people have at stake in the conflict? What do people have at stake in the resolution of the conflict? Right, um, uh, and not just on positions or ideologies or beliefs, right, because the positions that people have, those things can't be changed, or they're at least really hard to change. And if uh, coming to an agreement or managing this conflict requires changing everyone's positions. That seems like an insurmountable uh, challenge. But if we're just worried about our interests at stake in this particular conflict and not about general positions, if we're interested in the problem at hand and not the people involved, like these are ways of getting getting through the conflicts. Um, generating possibilities. Uh, when people feel that they're contributing to solutions, they're more likely to accept those solutions. If you just hand people solutions, then, they're, then they might reject them. They, uh, it might not look like the solution at all if it's just uh, if someone's told to just do something. Um, but if you generate solutions in a way in a way that includes other people, then they're more likely to um, accept and see the value of those solutions. Uh, yeah, so there's there's more discussion of this kind of managing conflict stuff um, in the in the book. Um, uh, I don't want to lecture too much. I feel like I'm lecturing too much. Uh, so a lot of this stuff is also gone over in the um, lecture video. Uh, so yeah, so I just wanted to go through through this. Uh, Uh, one of the videos I have. Whoa. To answer that question, uh, I'll, I'll mute this. So one of the videos I have uh, in the Prezi that you can watch. I think this might also be linked in the Moodle. Um, you might have seen this go around on social media. It's, it's sort of popular, but uh, this is a this is a modern update of the uh, Ash conformity experiment. So conformity experiments, remember, are with your social peers. Yeah, it's Andrea sees this one. Yeah, good. Um, so so this is a kind of conformity. Experiment. So. Uh, she's not told uh, to stand up, but uh, everyone, so everyone else in this room, the, the, the woman in the purple jacket is not told to stand up, but everyone else in this room is an actor who's playing along with this experiment. It's, uh, they're, they're acting as if they're members of the public, but they're actually told all to stand up at, at the tone, and the point is to see if she stands up also, and she does, she stands up reliably at the tone. Uh, so one of the lessons here is that she doesn't have to be told explicitly to do this. You don't have to give her an order or command. You just have to create an environment where everyone else is doing it, and people will tend to conform. Um, it's uh, 
uh, this kind of conformity is actually fairly um, subtle. Um, this is based, uh, this is an update of the ash conformity experiment. Um, ash conformity experiment was uh, done in the 50s and uh, it's a simpler task. So the task was just to look at these lines and then to say which line of these ABC matches the line over here. Um, it's pretty clearly that it's C that matches the line and not A and B. And most people can tell, if you have good enough vision, you can tell that the, it's C that's the right line. But if you put people in a group of other people and you have everyone else say the wrong answer, if you have everyone else say A, um, then you're more likely to say A, a also. And Ash found this was a pretty reliable effect. Uh, but it, it wasn't terrifically strong. So his original uh, experiment, 63% um, went, went along with the right answer. They stayed with their correct answer. And only 35% uh, changed their answer, uh, gave the incorrect answer. 5% uh, uh, always gave the wrong answer. But 35% of people would give the wrong answer um, when they were pressured by the social, uh, by the social environment. 35% of people um, changed, their, changed their answer in order to conform to the social environment. Uh, that's, it's not that strong. It's, it's an influence. People are strongly influenced, uh, people are influenced by it. Um, the stronger effect is the Milgram experiment, um, which is an obedience experiment. It's not a conformity experiment. Um, in the Milgram experiment, you're, um, you're being told by, it, by, the, uh, by the experimenter. The experimenter is like a professor in a lab coat. He looks, like, he looks very official. And he's telling you, uh, he's telling you to do something. In the experiment, he's telling you to administer shock treatments of increasingly high voltage um, against the wishes of the uh, recipient. So the recipient is screaming, uh, crying, uh, saying that it hurts, stop, they don't want to go on. But the experimenter keeps telling you to administer these shocks. And um, the question is, how, how, how far do you go with these shocks? How many shocks are you willing to administer? Uh, um, the obedience experiments involve an authority figure who is, right, so it's not just your peers, it's not just the social environment, but it's someone who is in a position of authority. And Milgram found that 65% of people went through with the final uh, highest intensity shock. Six, that's 65% of people. Remember, only 35% of people uh, would conform to the social environment uh, to say the wrong size of the line. About 35% of the people will do the stand up at the buzzer thing. But about 65% of people will do something like shock another person uh, and make them scream out in pain. 65% of the people will do that just from prodding, uh, from the prodding of an authority figure. So in other words, we're more than twice as susceptible to the influence of authority as we are to the influence of our peers. Uh, yeah. So uh, in uh, on Moodle, I have a link to um, the actual Milgram experiment. Uh, video. This is the this is the 1962. This is the original experiment, and they have uh, the video of the subjects and how well, much they're willing to uh, shock people. Uh, this person refuses pretty quickly to continue with shocking. He's one of the, he's in the minority where he, he refuses to go on right away. I, I strongly recommend you watch these, these guys. It's very compelling. Um, but this guy at the end in the white shirt, uh, he goes through all the way through with final intensity shock. Uh, maybe I should uh, uh, make clear uh, that no one is actually shocked in the Milgram experiment. There's no actual shocks administered. No one actually feels any painful shocks. Um, it's all just a setup. The experimenter and the learner are um, confederates of the experiment. They're, they're actors. And in fact, the learner is uh, replaced with a, a, a tape recording of someone screaming in pain every time the shock is administered. Um, so, so, so the response from the learner is standardized. Um, and the, the question is not about administering shocks. The question is just how, how many shocks is the teacher willing to administer? So if you watch the Milgram videos, there's this guy. Uh, and he goes, he, he fights it. 
Um, he's not just a willing seller. He's not just sort of mindlessly going along with it, just administering trucks. He can hear the person screaming in the other room. And so he feels uncomfortable about it. And you can see just from his body language, not, not even listening to him, you can see that he's reluctant to go on. Um, he holds his head in his hands. Um, uh, he's very agitated. He gets up out of his seat a couple of times. Um, he's not comfortable with what he's doing. He's not, he's not okay with what he's doing. But because the experimenter tells him to keep going on, he, he goes on. And there's this one moment, um, I'm not going to try to find it, but there's this one moment where he says, well, look, who has responsibility if something happens? And the instructor says, or the experimenter says, uh, it's my responsibility. And the guy says, okay. And then he turns around and he starts reading off the numbers again and starts administering shocks again. So, um, as soon as the experimenter says that they're willing to take up the responsibility, uh, then he, if, if the responsibility is not on him, if the responsibility is somewhere else, then he'll go through with it. Right, this is how people think about this. I think I might have talked about this last week. Um, in psychology, we call this the diffusion of responsibility. Uh, that that uh, we don't want the responsibility on ourselves. So we look for ways of uh, blaming others or at least just shifting the burden around so it's not just my fault. Um, uh, um, the book talks about reasoning like um, if I don't do it, someone else will. So I might as well do it. Uh, um, when Dennis Joya blames the script, uh, when he blames the script for making his decision, um, he's trying to get out of the responsibility that it's not his fault because he was just following the script. The fault was with the bad script. He, he needs a, we need a better script, he says. Well, but it was also his choice to follow that script. And by blaming it on the script, he's sort of allevi he's uh, lessening the responsibility that he himself faces. And maybe that's not fair. Maybe uh, he has a responsibility to make sure that he's following the right scripts, um, that he's following the right orders. So this uh, shows up in the readings as uh, the Nuremberg defense, so the superior orders defense that I was just following orders. You know, if you do something wrong. Well, it was my fault I did something wrong because I was just doing what my, my boss told me to do. Um, so it's important to know that uh, this defense, um, it, usually, it usually doesn't work. Um, it's usually not an excuse of your responsibility for following unjust orders. You have, say it another way, you have a responsibility to follow, uh, to, to uh, not follow unjust orders. I think this is an MLK code. Um, Yeah, everyone has a moral responsibility to uh, disobey unjust laws. Uh, civil disobedience. That one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. That one has a responsibility to not follow with orders, not obey laws that tell you to do things that are not right. If your boss tells you to do something that you know is not safe, you have a responsibility to not follow that order. But it's hard. We. Uh, have, uh, especially when the person's an authority figure, especially when they have influence over our career, our salary, our future. Um, it's very hard to not listen to them. It's very hard to ignore them and do the right thing. Right. In these cases, it's not a matter of knowing what the right thing is. Right. This guy knows that it's wrong to be shocking someone. The, the challenge is actually doing it in the face of uh, in the face of the social pressure, in the face of um, someone looking over your shoulder. Uh, maybe that got, um, I mean, I could, I could make it, I could go further, but I, I will stop there. Keith, Andrea, has any other questions? I've been talking for about half an hour. Um, I don't want to overburden people with material. No questions yet.
uh, I guess I could keep talking at the screen. Let me, oh, um, the secret word is, uh, so I gave, uh, so script, so script is the secret word for the lecture. Um, the secret word for uh, the hangout will be fo follower. Let me confirm that that's right on the, uh, the quiz, there's the attendance. Follower. Um, uh, Jerry says she should have a lot of personal case study for the this week's topic. Um, uh, yeah, that would be great. Um, I, uh, don't feel any pressure to sh share, uh, but it, but if you have stories um, that you're willing to share uh, from your own um, uh, work experience, from your on, on the job experience, um, from your own uh, experience just being a person, um, uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to. Uh, um, those kinds of experiences help. Uh, yeah, with regard to work responsibilities and rights. Yeah, um, those kinds of those kinds of uh, workplace experiences help quite a lot. Um, you know, um, I'm uh, I'm an academic. I, I teach a class, and sometimes my conversation can get pretty theoretic, sort of abstract, uh, and not really tied to the uh, material. So when students can give their own work, workplace experience or their own personal experience, uh, I think it helps a lot to contextualize how these kinds of issues can arise. Yeah, <laughs> she says, uh, maybe I won't read that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Oh, let me, let me think. Um. So I, I think I said all, all I want to say. Um, if uh, I talk about some of this material in a lot more detail in the lecture video, which uh, I encourage you to watch. Um, although you have the secret word now, so you don't really need to watch it. But uh, um, I have some stuff on uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, I think, in the lecture video. Uh, that's really good. Um, it's very difficult reading. Um, the first follower video is fun. Uh, next week we talk about whistleblowing um, and we introduce our third ethical theory. Um, whistleblowing, so this week we're talking about why it's important to sometimes disobey your orders and next week we'll talk about what to do when, you, when, it's, when it's time to disobey. Uh, so whistle, whistleblowing is going to be the cases where, um, uh, where you have concerns that aren't being taken seriously by your uh, organization and so you step outside the organization in some way. Um, or, or, or you go around the standard procedure. So maybe, maybe it's just as simple as going over your boss's head to his boss, um, and maybe that uh, violates protocol in some sense, but maybe if your boss is having an issue that that's the right thing to do. And maybe if your boss's boss all the way up to the CEO is having an issue, then you have to go outside to, um, to the government, to uh, someone like a regulator, uh, maybe you have to go to the press, um, uh, and these are hard, these are very hard questions because they, um, uh, it, uh, it's not just standing up to authority, but it's also facing the repercussions of standing up to authority. And sometimes those repercussions can be very severe. And so we'll talk about the ethics of uh, when and why to whistleblow um, next week. Um, we'll also talk about deontological ethics or uh, duty ethics, uh, which is the second ethical theory. Um, 
next week's a little bit of a dry week. Uh, the material for this week, I think, is pretty fun. We have all the psychology stuff, which I like. Uh, so uh, I hope I hope you enjoy that material. Thanks, Andrea, for sticking around, uh, making me not feel so lonely. Um, uh, if uh, I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, I'll stick around in the chat for the next 20 minutes or so if anyone else shows up and wants to ask a question about their grades or anything else. Oh, uh, lots of students keep email, emailing me about the grades almost immediately after the assignments are due. P please wait a week. Please be patient. Um, I have a lot of students. Uh, okay, yeah, that's it. I'm in the video there. Thank you.